Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to another video. My name is Dylan and I'm a cycling coach at CTS and today we're going to be tackling two questions. How long does it take to lose fitness when you stop riding? And will taking a break from riding actually make you faster in the long run? I'll also touch on what happens physiologically during detraining, what to do if you find yourself with less time to train mid-season, and the somewhat scary effects that chronic hard training may have on your blood values and your hormone levels like testosterone. If you're new to this channel, I make weekly science-based training, racing, and gear-related videos. If you want to learn how to get faster or just more about the science of training in general, then be sure to subscribe. And if you have a training question or a topic you'd like to see me cover in a future video, be sure to leave it in the comment section down below. I do my best to get to all the questions in the comments. Taking a break from training strikes a very real fear into every serious endurance athlete, whether it be because of work, an injury, or weather getting bad and motivation dwindling. You may start to wonder whether you're going to lose all the fitness you've worked to build up and how long it'll take to regain it. To start things off, let's address the main question of this video, which is how long does it take to lose fitness and what physiological changes occur when you lose fitness? This study on the time course for loss of endurance adaptation studied seven endurance exercise trained subjects after cessation of training. They found that VO2 max decreased by 7% after 21 days and stabilized at 16% after 56 days. And this seems to be consistent. This review article on short-term detraining found that VO2 max has been shown to decline in less than four weeks in highly trained individuals. This decline can be anywhere from four to 14% and more trained individuals see more decline. What are some of the reasons for this declining VO2 max? Most of the initial fitness loss is due to loss of blood volume, which can drop by five to 12% and has been shown to decline within the first two days of inactivity. Along with this comes a reduction in stroke volume or the amount of blood your heart pumps per stroke, reduced maximal cardiac output, and quite literally smaller heart muscles, a reduced thickness and mass of the left ventricle, which is the chamber of the heart responsible for pumping blood to the body. And there is a way to see all this cardiovascular detraining right there on your head unit, with an increased heart rate of 5 to 10%. Once you get back on the bike after a long break, one of the first things you'll likely notice is how much higher your heart rate is for the same given effort. As far as endurance goes, the review reported a 4 to 25% shorter time to exhaustion over this time period, and it appears that there is metabolic detraining that occurs as well, with a higher reliance on carbohydrates instead of fat during exercise. Four weeks is considered short-term detraining, but it seems that if detraining lasts longer than this, then the effects start to taper off. This review on long-term detraining found that VO2 max decreases by 6 to 20% in the long term, which isn't a lot more than the initial 4 to 14%. After eight weeks, it appears to stabilize. So you could probably expect to lose most of your fitness after about a month, and then bottom out after about two months. However, even after all this time, you'll still be in better shape than before you started riding. Going back to the study on the time course of loss of endurance adaptation, they found that muscle capillarization and oxidative enzyme activity remained above sedentary levels, which may help to explain why AVO2 difference and VO2 max after 84 days of detraining were still higher than in untrained subjects. Gaining this fitness back will depend on how well trained you were to begin with. The fitness gains will be quick at first and then taper off, and if you were well trained, it'll take longer to get it back than it took you to lose it. Essentially what this all boils down to is that the amount of fitness you lose varies quite a bit, but the more highly trained you are, the more you're likely to lose, and the longer it will take to get it back. Up to this point, we've been talking about what happens when you stop training completely, or the kind of thing that might happen when you get injured. <laughs> yeah, injured. That's a nice way of saying I just lost all motivation to train this past month. However, what if you simply have less time to train? Let's say work picks up or other life obligations and you have to cut your volume down. Is all hope lost or is there a way to maintain your fitness? For this, let's take a look at two different detraining studies, one that reduced volume and the other that reduced intensity. In both studies, the subjects trained for 10 weeks and then either had a one-third or two-thirds reduced training load for 15 weeks. The difference was that in the one study they reduced volume and in the other study they reduced intensity. The result? In the study that reduced intensity long-term, endurance was decreased significantly by 21% in the one-third reduced group and by 30% in the two-thirds reduced group. However, in the study that reduced volume long-term, endurance remained the same in the one-third group and decreased by only 10% in the two-thirds reduction group. If you do need to reduce your training volume mid-season, then the key is to maintain intensity. 
In fact, this method is straight out of the tapering handbook. A meta-analysis looking at many studies on the effects of tapering on performance found that the optimal tapering strategy was one that reduced volume without any modifications in intensity or frequency. With a reduction in volume, you may actually be able to do higher quality workouts since you won't be as fatigued. Even though your CTL will drop, you may end up with some pretty good results. However, if the reduced volume goes on for long enough, then you will see a drop in performance, especially for longer events. Given that it is the off season right now for many of us though, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, this isn't what I would do to maintain fitness throughout the winter. In fact, it may actually be beneficial to purposefully detrain at this time of year. That's right, letting your fitness drop may actually make you faster in the long term. I've talked quite a bit on this channel about the importance of a mid-season break, and it's pretty surprising to people that just not riding at all for a week may actually lead to better results later in the season than had they just continued training normally. Yeah, but dude, you know the LTC or TLC or Whatever, you know, the fitness number on training peaks. It says I'm getting less fit when I take a break. And to be honest, this isn't something that's well studied at all. It's more something that pros and average Joes alike have figured out by trying to push through a whole season and being completely spent by the end of the year and having results that reflect that. The same goes for the off season. Having some time completely off the bike and then some time after that that's unstructured and not overly stressful in your body will set you up for a better season. One explanation for this could be how chronic intense exercise affects your hormones. This study on hormone response of pro cyclists during competition looked at nine riders from two teams during the Vuelta. Blood samples from these riders were taken before the race and then after week one, two, and three. What they found was that starting testosterone levels were lower in the team that had more racing days in the previous month and testosterone further decreased in both teams each week throughout the race. Sure, but that's during a Grand Tour stage race where riders are pushing themselves for hours a day for three weeks. It's not surprising to see hormonal responses like this. However, even non-cycling athletes' hormones may be suppressed by hard training. This study on the effect of detraining on power athletes found that after 14 days of detraining, levels of growth hormone and testosterone significantly increased while cortisol and creatine kinase levels decreased. It's very possible that taking a break from physical activity gives your hormones a chance to come back to base level, thereby increasing future performance. Another explanation could be blood values. This study looking at blood parameters of top-level cyclists over the course of a year found that hematocrit and hemoglobin concentration decreased throughout the season and then returned to baseline level in the off-season. That jump back up you see is in November when pros commonly take a break. Those are some of the physiological reasons to take a break, but there are also psychological reasons as well. Taking a break acts as a huge boost to motivation. Cyclists are often itching to get back on the bike after not riding for a while. As the old saying goes, you don't miss the water until the well runs dry. Never taking a break could very well lead to burnout. Whatever the psychological or physiological reason for the off-season and mid-season break success, it's common practice amongst pro cyclists and athletes of other sports as well. So when we finish the season, or when we finish, when we finish the marathon, then we need to have some four, four days of just running slowly to recover and make sure our bodies are really uh, QR12. Then we have a three weeks uh, of really uh, total rest. And then we start again. When we are starting, we are starting at zero. We treat it as zero. That's why we, are, we, are, we need to have a four months to, to run around. So, what should your off season look like? You want to start the off season with a week to two weeks completely off the bike. In fact, this time should have no physical activity in it. No running, no gym, no... Oh, come on, man. It was just an easy spin. I barely even got my heart rate up. <laughs> you don't want any activity during this time. It's funny how hard this is for cyclists to follow. For a motivated athlete, it's often harder to stick to a full week off than it is a hard interval session. One to two weeks is not enough time for you to lose all your fitness. This study on the effects of short-term exercise cessation had competitive runners stop running for 10 days. Blood volume decreased, which caused an increase in exercise heart rate. However, resting heart rate, blood pressure, cardiac dimensions, and VO2 max were unchanged after this break. After the break from riding, take some time to just enjoy riding and let go of structure. Don't try to stick to any zone or try to get a certain number of hours per week. 
Just ride when you feel like it for as long as you feel like it at a comfortable pace. Some people may have to leave the bike computer at home during this time and that's fine. This is also a great time to start weightlifting because when you first get in the gym, you're going to be incredibly sore and getting in any high quality work on the bike is going to be near impossible. I recently made a whole video on the science of why cyclists should be lifting and what they should be doing in the gym and I'll leave it down in the description below if you're interested. All right, let's do a quick recap. VO2 max, blood volume, stroke volume, and cardiac output will all decrease after four weeks off the bike, and how much they decrease will depend on how well trained you were. After about eight weeks, detraining tapers off. However, even after all this time, you still will be in better shape than before you started riding. Getting back in shape after this time will take longer if you were well trained. If you have to reduce your training volume, make sure that you maintain your intensity. If you do this, you can maintain your fitness level at least for a couple of weeks. However, at the end of the season, it's a good idea to take a break from not only high intensity, but from riding altogether. If you don't ride for a week or two, your blood volume will decrease, which will translate into a decrease in performance. However, you won't see a huge drop in VO2 max or your other performance markers, so getting back in shape after a break like this won't take that long and it's actually recommended mid-season and during the off-season and will likely lead to better performance. Possible reasons for this could be resetting hormone levels or blood values, or it could simply be psychological and the boost in motivation is what causes the increase in fitness. Whatever the reason, it's common practice amongst professionals and that's because it works. After the break, take some time to do some unstructured fun rides where you aren't overly concerned about racking up TSS or what zone you're in. The off season is also a great time to start lifting because your rides don't need to be high quality. Thanks for watching and I hope you guys found this information helpful. If you like this video, be sure to give it a like, share it with a friend and subscribe. And if you wanna be notified every time I put out a video, be sure to hit the notification bell as well. If you're looking for a coach, if you sign up through CTS, be sure to use my code CTSDJ to save $40 by waiving the registration fee. Details are down in the description.